So I have a quick story for you. One time, our family, we have three kids who were adopted from foster care. We were driving on a long car trip and we had our dog with us. We decided to stop at a restaurant that had an outdoor dining area. It was like a fast food restaurant. And there was only one other family sitting in this area and they also had a dog. And so we, you know, kept our distance. We sat pretty far away. But as soon as we walked up to this area, one of my children, was so angry and upset seeming, and I was really confused. They were speaking in a really rude voice to their siblings, bossing them around, telling them where they could sit and where they couldn't sit, acting annoyed as if they wanted to switch seats with someone, and even yelling at the dog and trying to get them from moving around or doing anything. I was so confused by this behavior because previously to this, my kids seemed really happy about going to this restaurant and they were excited. They were happy the dog was with us. So I was kind of like, why are they being so rude out of nowhere? Where is this attitude coming from? I was like, maybe they didn't really like the restaurant we chose. Maybe they're just grumpy, you know? But it got to the point where it was happening so much. I was like, I have to do something about this. I have to talk to this child. So I pulled the child aside and I just started asking some questions. And what I found out was it wasn't that the child was annoyed or angry, they were anxious because it turns out that the type of dog that other family had was the same breed of dog that bit one of their biological siblings when they were younger. And this sibling had to get stitches and it was a really big traumatic event. And so what I was interpreting as just grumpiness or a bad attitude was actually coming out of a lot of fear and anxiety. This dog reminded them of a really dangerous and scary situation. And so they were reacting with fear. And what I discovered was that day my child was experiencing a trauma trigger. And trauma triggers are so common for kids who have spent time in foster care. So today let's talk about different types of trauma triggers your children might have and some tips on how we can help our kids get through those. Hey, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Katie and I am an adoptive mom to three kids who came to us through the US foster care system. I have spent the past five years of my life in the adoption world and now I work as an adoption consultant for families who are looking to adopt waiting children from foster care. So if you are interested in learning about trauma, foster care related topics, definitely subscribe to the channel because that is pretty much all I do. So it's no secret that kids in foster care have experienced some sort of trauma, whether it's separation from their birth family, they've experienced some form of abuse or have been exposed to some sort of violence. The truth is that the kids we welcome into our home through foster care and adoption, a lot of these kids have faced situations that we have never had to experience in our lives. And here's the thing, trauma can hit our kids at seemingly random times. In fact, oftentimes like my story earlier, we may not even realize it's a trauma related reaction at first. So today I wanna to talk about some common types of trauma triggers our kids can experience and how we can support them. So the first trauma trigger I wanna talk about is loss and separation. Kids in foster care have experienced so much loss in their short lives. They have had to say goodbye to their biological parents, sometimes to biological siblings. They've had to say goodbye to extended family. And honestly, I'm saying they said goodbye, but they didn't really get to say goodbye. In most cases, they were taken very quickly and didn't have contact with any of those people ever again. And this can include their neighborhood friends or their school friends. And then when they go into foster care, oftentimes kids live in multiple placements. And so they've had to say goodbye to foster parents, to the homes that they were living in. Caseworkers tend to change a lot throughout a child's time in foster care. So they've had to say goodbye to many different caseworkers. They've had to switch therapists often if they're switching foster homes, they've completely opened up to this one therapist and now all of a sudden they're going to another one. And they've had to say goodbye to schools they went to, teachers they had, school friends they had. There's just so much loss that they have experienced in their short lives. And because of this, our kids can be easily triggered by situations that remind them of loss and can bring separation anxiety upon them. So obviously there are big things that will remind our children of loss, like their friends moving away and they don't really get to say goodbye, maybe the death of a pet, the death of a loved one. If your family has to move somewhere new, the child could feel a lot of anxiety around that because while they may not be losing you, they're losing that physical space that they lived in and were comfortable in and they might also be losing their school again and their friends. 
So as you can imagine, those bigger things can feel really traumatizing and can really set a kid off. You could have a kid who was doing really, really well for a long time, seem to be overcoming their trauma, and those things can just re-trigger them. But what I find interesting is the smaller things, the day-to-day -day things that you just don't expect. For most people, it wouldn't cause them any stress or any anxiety, but for our kids who have experienced loss, it really can. A big trigger for a lot of kids is when caseworkers visit after they're placed in a new home. So I know we experience this with our kids, when our caseworker would visit, the adoption caseworker would come to the house or also their foster caseworker would come to our house. Instant stress in some of our children. One of my kids would be biting themselves and would be so nervous and would start sucking their thumb and they were much too old really to be sucking their thumb and they didn't do it normally. It was like this complete reversion and there's just this fear, I think, that the caseworker reminds them of the times they were separated from their biological family. And in their bodies, they might be feeling like, oh no, it's going to happen again because this person is here again. Even if we know that's not what's happening, it's hard to explain that to a kid who's been through tremendous and unexpected loss like they have to have entered the foster care system. If the adopted or foster parent works outside of the home, the act of the parent leaving to go to work can be a huge trauma trigger. You might notice that your kids are all of a sudden acting really terrible right before you have to leave for work or even to go meet up with a friend, just to leave in, for any reason, to leave to the grocery store. Their reactions can be so much bigger than you would expect. One of my children still to this day deals with a lot of triggers related to loss and separation. And the sound of someone touching their keys. So we have to walk through our laundry room to get to our garage to get out of our house. And so in that laundry room, we have our car keys. And if I even pick up my keys and that child hears the keys jingle, they will be rushing to the door asking where I am going. And oftentimes I'm not going anywhere. I was going to put something in my car or get something out of my car, or I was just rearranging things or putting my keys away. But the absolute fear that can sometimes come over them and this irrational fear because I always show back up. I don't just leave without saying goodbye, but it still happens. Our door also makes a really loud squeaking sound when you open it to leave. And so if they hear that sound when I'm going to take the trash out or something like that, again, running to the door, where are you going? Why are you leaving? Why are you leaving me? And I'm not leaving, I'm not even going anywhere. And so that still happens and we are years in and we still run into these triggers. And I think we've done a pretty decent job of building up that trust, but it still can happen. You know, it's just something that is really hard to let go of and to let go of that fear for our kids who have experienced these major losses and major changes early in their lives. Another one could be taking long car trips, maybe being in the car sets your child off and they are all of a sudden acting awful, they won't sit still, they're screaming or yelling, that can be really reminding them of going in a car to move somewhere else again and again. And so you may find that those car trips can be a little bit triggering. And so it can be very difficult when you don't understand why your child is acting that way. And some kids are just not good in the car. I don't wanna say that every single time that it's always a trauma trigger, but I think we should be asking ourselves about, could it be, could it be a trauma trigger? Meeting new people can be really stressful and re again, remind them of having to meet new people over and over again every time they're in a new placement or a new location or a new family. And another thing that can be really difficult, and this is very relevant because it's back to school season as I'm making this video, but get, even getting a new teacher can be really hard. Like the beginning of the school year, having to say goodbye to the previous year's teacher, having to get to know and meet a new teacher can be really triggering and remind them of loss and they might have a bigger reaction than some kids their age would. Even if the teacher leaves for maternity leave, which we have had happen multiple times to our kids early on in the process too, which was so frustrating because it clearly triggered my kid who was going through this. And it was multiple teachers who were out at once for maternity leave and our child really struggled and it was really difficult for them to trust the new teacher, to bond with the new teacher, to listen to the new teacher. And 
that just complicated things a lot. And here's the thing, even though these are all triggers that are involved in loss and separation, our kids are going to respond differently to triggers based on their attachment styles. Some kids are going to be like my child I was talking about who are clingy and fearful. If you're going to leave, they're gonna run up to you and ask where you're going and try to hug you and not let you leave. But other kids react differently. Some kids' reaction is to withdraw, to pretend like they don't care about you, to actually act out in a way that makes you think they don't want me around. And other kids will do a combination where they're doing a little bit of both of those things and it's super confusing and you don't know which day you're gonna get which reaction. And so how can we help our kids when they're having loss and separation triggers? One of the biggest ones is to just keep your promises and show up when you say you're going to show up. So be really careful about telling your child you're going to be somewhere, you're going to be home at a certain time, you're gonna do these things if you're not going to actually be able to do it. Now, obviously sometimes things happen, but for the most part, we should be really conscious as foster and adoptive parents of keeping the promises that we make. You also wanna make sure you can provide them a stable environment, that you're not having to move all of the time or you're not having constant change going on, that you can provide that secure and stable home environment with as minimal major changes as possible. Again, life happens, but we often do have control over a lot of those. And I know we always say that actions speak louder than words, but I still think words are very important. I think your child needs to hear the sentence, I am not going to leave you, I'm not going anywhere. I love you, you're always going to be my child, nothing that you can do is going to change that. Those types of words are very helpful for your child to hear, especially if they're younger and they can't fully understand and like read into your actions the same way an older kid or an adult could read into your actions. Sometimes you just need to say it really bluntly. Also, I wanna make a quick recommendation for a book that you can read to your kids who have those loss and separation triggers. It's called The Invisible String. It is a great children's book and I will put a link to it in the description below if you're interested. But basically it's kind of saying how there's an invisible string between you and all the people that are in your life that you love and are connected to. So even if you're far apart, there's still a connection between you and that person. Even if your parent goes to work, you still have that connection. That book was really good for our kids. Actually, we should probably read it again, to be honest with you, with my with my child who's very fearful of the loss and separation. It is a great one though to have in your home library for your kids to access. All right, I'm gonna interrupt myself for a minute to let you know that tomorrow, August 23rd, if you are watching this video when it goes live, tomorrow, August 23rd at 11.59 p.m., the doors to the Adopt Together community are closing. So if you want to join a community of people who are looking to adopt from foster care or people who already have adopted from foster care, you do not wanna miss your opportunity to join this group. And this is your last opportunity to get that $10 a month price point locked in because the next time the group opens, the price will be higher. The other thing is we will not be opening again until early 2025. And so if you are in the process of adopting from foster care and you are looking for a group of people who understand what you're going through and are going to be there for you, you do not wanna miss out. If you're not familiar with the community, Adopt Together is a private family Facebook community where you will have 24 seven access to ask questions to people in the group. There are monthly video trainings about topics relevant to adopting from foster care, worksheets and quizzes and practical ways to apply what you're learning to your actual life as an adoptive parent. And my favorite is monthly coaching calls. And each month we pick a topic. So this month that we're currently in, in August, our topic has been dealing with difficult emotions surrounding adoption, both for our kids and for the parents. But my September topic is actually super relevant to the point I was just talking about, which is attachment styles. So if you would like to figure out what your attachment style is, what your adopted child's attachment style is, or if you just like to learn about it ahead of time so that you know what to expect. I think it's gonna be an awesome month. We have really great resources we're gonna be handing out. We're gonna discuss healthy attachment versus unhealthy and talk about all the different types and how it can affect your relationships. We already have quite a few members in the group and it's been so wonderful getting to know them 
it's awesome seeing people make connections in the comments and find other people from their same state who are adopting from foster care. And we would love to have you join the group as well. I will put the link in the description below for you to check that out, learn more about it, figure out if it's the right fit for you. So check out the link in the description below and I hope to see you in there. Okay, the second type of trauma trigger that we are going to talk about today are traumatic memory triggers. So that example that I gave at the very beginning of this video with my child who was being triggered by the sight of a specific breed of dog, that is an example of a traumatic memory trigger because this child has a very traumatic memory of their sibling being bit by a dog and having to get all these stitches and it was a really scary thing. But traumatic memory triggers can come in all shapes and sizes basically. Seeing or smelling a specific type of food could remind someone of a traumatic memory. Hearing a specific type of music, seeing a rundown neighborhood. A big one for a couple of our kids is smelling cigarette smoke or the smell of marijuana. Seeing people drink alcohol can be traumatic for some kids because they may have experienced something very negative when the adults around them were drinking alcohol. And obviously huge ones would be seeing a gun or a weapon, even if it's just for hunting or it's just, you know, a, a collector's item, it can really trigger those really traumatic memories. And seeing anyone fight, whether that's a physical fight or just a verbal argument, those things can be really scary to our kids who have experienced trauma. So how can we help? First of all, be observant. If you notice your child is suddenly acting really angry or mean or grumpy, and it just feels completely out of nowhere after entering a new environment, you might just wanna look around and see because fear often manifests itself in anger. Anxiety often manifests itself in anger. And so what we might think is our kid just being rude is actually them expressing fear. And there is a difference. Sometimes kids are just rude, right? But that's one of the difficult parts of being a parent of kids with trauma is trying to distinguish which is which. And so we have to be observant and we have to be willing to sit down with our child, ask them questions in a calm way, give them space and a chance to sit down, take deep breaths and explain what's going on and reminding your child that they are safe and you are there for them. And sometimes the best way to avoid these triggers leading to an outburst of some sort is to think ahead to specific triggers that you know they might encounter in a situation. And there are many times we can't predict it at all, but if there's a way you know you can predict it, just talking with the child about that beforehand can be helpful. So for example, my husband and I do not drink. There are multiple reasons for that. We have many friends who do. We don't think there's anything wrong with it. But for us, our kids are very glad that we do not because seeing alcohol containers or anything like that can be very triggering to them. And so it just works out that we didn't drink before and we don't drink now. But there are times where we may go to someone else's home to visit or to hang out and those people may have alcohol like on display or in a case or something like that. Or they may drink some wine and those things can be really triggering to our kids. So one thing I try to do is just talk to that child before we go and say, hey, you know, these friends do drink alcohol occasionally but they're safe to be around. No one is going to be drinking in excess. We would not put you into that sort of situation and we will make sure that you stay safe and everyone else stays safe as well. Just those little things and letting them know ahead of time, they won't be so shocked by seeing it and then not be able to move on. So just a little tip there, you can sometimes in certain situations warn them of things that will happen. And the last type of trigger I want to discuss today is unpredictability and change triggers. These are so hard to avoid because life happens and sometimes the schedule changes or things don't work out. But for a kid who's been in foster care, who's had basically no control over the changes that they've experienced in their lives, these types of changes, even small ones, can remind them of that feeling of powerlessness and bring a lot of fear or even anger into their bodies. So whether that's changing the plan for the day last minute, a school schedule being different on a given day, whether it's because of a field trip or, a, or an in-school presentation that's messing with the daily schedule, it could be that your child has a substitute teacher all of a sudden at school, even changing what is for lunch or dinner, what you had planned or what you had told them can really be difficult for a lot of kids, especially if they've dealt with food insecurity before, 
because if the plan changes, then it kind of opens up their mind to what if the plan changes to no food? Or what if the plan changes to a food that I hate and wouldn't ever wanna eat? And even things like a doctor's appointment being canceled or a therapist appointment being canceled. You get the idea. Any sort of change to the schedule can be really difficult. And kids in, with these types of triggers also will struggle with transitioning from one activity to another. So if you're at the park and you say, okay, it's time to leave and there's been no prior warning, this kid might have a meltdown because they were doing this and now you're switching it up on them. So there are a lot of things we can do to help in these situations because we can't necessarily prevent them from happening, but we can do our best to help our kids through that. One of the things I do constantly with my kids is give them little warnings when things are about to transition. So if we are at the park, like the example I just said, I will always tell them, okay kids, we have 10 minutes left at the park. And then I'll say, we have five minutes left at the park. And then I'll say, one minute left, go do the last thing you really wanna do before we go home. I cannot tell you how much that helps compared to me just all of a sudden going, it's time to go, get in the car, let's go, we have to go now, because it's just really jarring for them. And I think this is true for any kid, but I think especially kids who have experienced trauma or a loss of control, you get the idea. Also, do your best to try to stick to a general routine. Kids in general do great with routines and structure. That's why at schools, teachers will have these same routines and expectations so that the kids know what to expect. It can reduce some of that anxiety and the whole day just tends to run more smoothly. And if things are going to change, because as I said, life happens, one thing you can do is just try to let your child know as ahead of time as possible that things may change. That can help a lot. And again, this is life. They're going to have to deal with changes coming up. And so we'll do what we can, but eventually they are going to have to face this at some point and it's okay. It might not feel okay to them, but it is. And that is where the last tip here would just be remind them that even though it might feel scary or frustrating that things are changing, that they are okay and they're safe. I personally think it's good for them to have to face that every now and then because they can get through it and realize, oh, I survived. Oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought. And I am someone who deals with diagnosed anxiety. And so I understand the feeling of panic that can come with changed plans or not knowing what to expect. I get it, but again, oftentimes for me, I will go through a situation and go, oh, that actually wasn't as bad as I thought. So we can definitely help our kids through these triggers. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list of triggers by any means, but it should give you a good idea of some common triggers that your children may experience. It's so important to approach our children's behavior with curiosity and observation because things are not always what they seem. There could be a trauma trigger behind a behavior, which means that the way we're going to deal with that behavior is different than if it's just kind of a behavior because they're grumpy or because they didn't get their way. You get the idea. However, I do take a stance that some people may not agree with, but no matter how triggered my kids may feel, we teach them that it is not okay to treat others badly, to be violent, or to be intentionally hurtful simply because we are going through something hard. For example, one of my children who shall remain nameless, when they were at school, one of the very first years that they were with us, they had a really frustrating day with friends and with changes and being left out and probably had some of those loss and separation triggers going on. And so they were pulled inside to the classroom by a teacher when the other kids were off doing something else and you know the teacher wanted to talk to them and see what was going on because they weren't acting like their normal selves and my child proceeded to go and knock things off of desks and throw things on the ground in anger now <laughs> it was very strange to me because when the teacher told me about this they were very much like oh it's not a big deal they were really frustrated you know it was a really hard day and my husband and I did not feel as lenient as that teacher did because I do not believe in letting kids destroy a room just because they're having a bad day. I'm sorry, I was a teacher for 11 years. I think that accepting that type of behavior, it hurts our kids and it hurts the people around them. If it happens, okay, we talk about it, we make amends where they need to be made and we move on. 
but we do not accept that as a way of coping. And so that child did receive some consequences for that. They had to write an apology note to the teacher and they had some privileges removed until we saw that they could handle being able to have those things. So we did take a stance of kind of, we kind of do both things. We have the conversation about the trigger, what's triggering it, why they might have felt that way. But we also have the conversation of, it is completely okay for you to feel this way, but it is not okay for you to treat others badly. Everyone has bad days. A lot of people have triggers, but we cannot use that as an excuse for treating others badly. So that is my stance on it. Again, you may disagree. Feel free to share your opinions in the comments. But if you do have a child who tends to react in a very angry way to situations, to these triggers, and it doesn't seem to be getting better, I have a video all about how to help an angry child that I will put on one of these sides. Someday I'll learn which side it's on, but you can check it out. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and click the like button and more people can find it and it can hopefully help as many people as possible. And also, don't forget to join Adopt Together by tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. I hope you're having an amazing day and I will see you next week.